Hello again, and welcome to the Moments of Meditation. I am Reverend Philip Cousin. I'm the pastor of St. Andrew's Amy Church in Sacramento, California. And we are so blessed to have you tuning in again to worship with us this morning. We pray that our broadcast today may be a blessing to you. We're going to ask now if Mr. Carlos Fuentes would begin by leading us in a selection. Our selection will be a familiar hymn of the church, Holy, Holy, Holy. thy name in earth and sky and sea. We gather to praise your name this day, O Lord. 
we gather though we be the church scattered because we know in you we have communion in you we have refuge and so in the midst of whatever occupies us right now we declare that our hearts our minds even our very lives are occupied by you you alone O Lord sit on the very throne of our hearts we know that even in these times you still have us because they are still your times we ask now that you would bless grieving families this day. Those who have lost loved ones and friends to the coronavirus. And those dear master whose time it was simply to go home to be with you. Whose memories cannot be properly honored in this season because of quarantine and social distance but thanks be to you oh god you are never distant you are never far from us and even now we know that you are working with those who need you most to comfort and keep but we all need you right now, oh God. We need you to let us know that weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. And there is a joy that waits for us on the other side of this trial. Bless now families that have to come out and go in, first responders and caregivers, those demaster charged with being on the very front lines, putting their lives in jeopardy that ours might be safe. And we thank you right now for every blessing we receive even in this time. And may we be reminded that all of our blessings come from you and you alone. We thank you, God. We praise and glorify your name and we declare by faith right now that it will not be as long as it has been before the community of faith scattered becomes once again the community of faith united in one place on one accord in your house on this day. We thank you and we praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our scripture is going to be found in the book of Psalms. And in the book of Psalms, you're going to read the 67th Psalm in its entirety. And we will read it as it is found in the King James Version of the Bible. God be merciful unto us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us. That thy way may be known upon earth, thy saving health among all nations. Let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee. O let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For thou shalt judge the people righteously and govern the nations upon earth. Let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee. Then shall the earth yield her increase, and God, even our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us 
and all the ends of the earth shall fear him. That is Psalm 67 in its entirety. May God bless us as we read and share his written word. As we prepare now for the meditation, we will be favored again by another selection from Mr. Carlos Fuentes.
Amen. Amen. This morning, we're going to do the meditation in the form of a Bible study. I think that uh, it's been expressed to me on numerous occasions that our church family really enjoys that. So I'm going to ask that you get your Bible, I hope you have it with you, and turn to the first letter of Paul to the church at Corinth, that is 1 Corinthians, in chapter 11. We will be beginning our study at the 17th verse. As you are looking for that passage, let me begin after a fashion that the church family knows I truly enjoy, and that is by telling you a story. There was a church that had the same pastor for 35 years. He was one beloved by that congregation and by the whole community. After he was retired, in his course, he was replaced by a younger preacher, a new pastor. It was this younger pastor's first church, and he had a great desire to do well. He had been at the church several months when he began to perceive that the people were upset with him. He was troubled by it. So eventually he mustered up the courage to pull aside one of the officers of the church and he asked, saying, I don't know what's wrong, but I have a feeling that something is. His officer told his new pastor, yes, that's true. I hate to say it, pastor, but there is something wrong with the way you do communion. The young pastor was puzzled. He said, the way I do communion? What do you mean? Well, his officer continued, it is not so much what you do as it is what you leave out. The younger pastor thought for a moment and he said, I don't think I leave anything out of the communion service. The retort came back quickly and it was sharp. Oh yeah, you do. Just before our previous pastor administered the sacrament, he would always lean over and touch the cross. You never do that. It was only after touching the cross that he would administer the communion. The, the young preacher cut his officer off. He said, what? Touch the cross? He said, I've never heard of that liturgical tradition. So that afternoon, the new pastor called the former pastor. He told him, I haven't been here six months, and already I'm in trouble. His predecessor asked him why. And he responded, well, they, they tell me it's something to do with the communion service. It is something to do with me not touching the cross. Is that something you did? The old pastor responded, yes, I did. And then he laughed. I always touch the cross before I administered the sacrament, but I did it so that I would discharge the static electricity and not shock them when I administered it. Now the point, for over 35 years, the unknowing members of that congregation had thought that touching the cross was a part of the tradition of administering communion. Traditions get started and continued. And over time, people forget why they do what they do. So as we miss this time of communion, when on this Sunday, 
we will be fellowshipping together around God's altar at the conclusion of this message. Let us use this time to see what communion is supposed to be about. That we might not get mixed up and confuse tradition for practical obedience to the living God. We'll begin this study by looking at verses 17 through 22 in chapter 11 of that first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. And we will call this section Reconciliation. I use the King James Version because that is my standard, my favorite. But I'm going to read this from the New International Version as if I were at home this morning in St. Andrews. In the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. No doubt, there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat. For as you eat, each of you goes ahead without waiting for anybody else. One remains hungry, another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you for this? Certainly not. Paul begins these thoughts on communion with a stern rebuke of the Corinthian Christians. Just as parents sometimes have to scold their children in order for them to grow up, adults, so preachers sometimes have to scold congregations in order for them to grow up. Paul felt that this church at Corinth needed to be scolded because of this particular problem. Did you hear what Paul says about the way they observe the Lord's Supper? Well, in the early church, it was common, not just in Corinth, but throughout, to combine the Lord's Supper with a potluck supper. Not only did they participate in the Lord's Supper, but they also shared their evening meal with other believers. And that may seem like something strange, a strange way of doing it for us. But recall that it was during an actual meal, the Passover, that Jesus instituted this memorial meal, a meal forever captured and memorialized in da Vinci's painting, The Last Supper. It was during such that the Lord instituted communion. So it's not very much of a stretch to see why the early churches were following that pattern. However, Paul relates there was a problem with the way they were doing it. Notice that they weren't being rebuked for combining the Lord's Supper with a regular meal. They were being rebuked because of their attitudes. Their attitudes while partaking of this meal were nothing short of appalling. The first wrong attitude that Paul addresses is that they were divided. Paul spent much of the first three chapters of this first letter addressing the problem of divisions in this church. They had divided their local church into sects of people, groups who like to do certain things certain ways. And this division in the church manifested itself and was most problematic during their communion their community meal. Now, why would division be a problem during communion? 
After all, isn't communion a private thing? Isn't communion something that is between an individual and God? Well, the answer to those questions is a resounding no. Although communion is a time when a believer privately speaks to God in his or her own heart, communion is a congregational event. Communion is supposed to be a time of reconciliation with our brothers and sisters in Christ. When we participate in communion, God evaluates us in our relationships. And when there are relationships with other believers that are not right, we partake of communion in a manner that is not worthy. If we partake while holding a grudge against a brother or sister, we are sinning. Paul will have more to say about this at the end of this chapter. Division in the body of Christ is sin. Paul is saying that if we partake of the Lord's Supper without first being reconciled to our sisters and our brothers, we are misplacing our priorities. Communion is about Christ and not about us. It is why we extend the invitation to the table in the following manner. Were we in church this morning? I will say to you, ye that do truly and earnestly repent of your sin and are in love and charity with your neighbor and intend to lead a new life, following the commandments of God and walking from henceforth in his holy way. We invite you to come, draw near with faith and take this sacrament to your comfort. All of that is simply to say, when you come to the communion table, you have got to come correct. This invitation to the table is no ringing of a divine dinner bell, a Christian cattle call to come and get it. You cannot receive and be reconciled to Christ unless and until you are reconciled to each other. This is God's way. And the church cannot ever expect to be what God wants her to be if the church is not willing to do things God's way. We must first go and be reconciled to our brothers and sisters before we can be reconciled to God in Christ Jesus. The church will never be healthy without reconciled relationships. Divisive, attacking attitudes and the Lord's Supper do not mix. The Lord's Supper is about forgiveness, not about holding grudges. The Lord's Supper is about unity, not about division. Brothers and sisters who have differences should be reconciled to each other in their own hearts before they participate in the Lord's Supper. And so one of the purposes of communion is reconciliation. Another is remembrance. Listen to what Paul wrote in verses 23 through 25. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Remembering what Jesus did on Calvary is what communion is all about. 
Jesus said to do this in remembrance of him. As we partake of the Lord's Supper, we are to remember the sacrifice that was made by him for us on Calvary. We remember that nothing but the blood of Jesus has saved and washed away our sin. Nothing but the blood of Jesus can save us from a burning hell. Remembering. Remembrance. It is a very important aspect of communion. Lastly, in verses 27 through 32, we find that communion is about repentance. Listen to what verses 27 through 32 say. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we judged ourselves, we would not come under judgment. When we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned with the world. Repentance means to feel sorry for our sin. Repentance means to ask forgiveness for our sin. Repentance means that we accept the plan of God to avoid sinning in the future. That is repentance. Paul says that before we partake of communion, we should examine ourselves. Anyone who eats or drinks communion without recognizing the holiness of Jesus eats and drinks in a manner unworthy. When we eat and drink, we consider his sinless life, his holiness. And as we consider how holy Jesus is, we acknowledge how unholy we are. Now to do otherwise is to partake in a manner unworthy because we fail to consider the majesty of Jesus and the magnitude of what he has done for us. To come before Jesus without recognizing the fact that we aren't even worthy to be there is something extremely disrespectful to the Almighty God. So we should examine ourselves before we come into his presence. We should examine ourselves before we partake of communion. And we should repent of our sins. The president's new press secretary promised yesterday never to lie to the press corps. The New York Times reported that her promise never to lie was her first lie. Paul tells us we should repent of our sins. And that means confessing something else that Paul tells us all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. A thought he shared with the church at Rome. Perhaps we feel like we do not 
need to confess our sins because we have no sins to confess. That then would be the first sin. Paul feels this so important that he shares all of this with this church at Corinth, even divulging to them that perhaps because they were not partaking in a manner worthy, a lot of their people were coming up sick and dead. Isn't that something to consider? Suppose now the Almighty God is giving us this brief hiatus from communion in order that we might get right with him and with others so that when we do eat, it will be in a manner that is worthy. Paul tells the Corinthians, every sickness is not because of something you ate or some bug that you caught. He says, another reason for the sickness that you have in your midst might be because of folk failing to get right with each other and therefore failing to get right with God. It is a longer way of saying a simple truth. The church that is not partaking of communion in a worthy manner is a church that is not going to be a healthy church. Paul shared with them, when we allow the Lord to judge us during communion, it expedites our sentencing on judgment day. Listen again to verse 32. When we are being judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned with the world. If we partake of communion, the body and blood of Christ, in a worthy manner, we will not be judged and condemned on judgment day. If we repent during communion, we will not be judged and found guilty on judgment day. We will be judged, but we will be found forgiven. It is not just a matter of feeling sorry for what we have done wrong. It's not just a matter of asking forgiveness for what we have done wrong. It is a matter of making the changes necessary in our living that will keep wrong from happening again. So let us use this time as we miss our communion together to get right. If you are harboring any ill will in your heart toward anyone, and oh, the preacher is preaching to himself right now, you have got to get right with others before you can get right with God. That is on the believing side. Let me turn our attention for a moment to the non-believing side. You cannot begin to get right with anybody until you get right with God. If you do not have a relationship with God in Christ Jesus, then we invite you right now to get one. Just confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead and you shall be saved. If you would bow your head with me now for just a moment and pray with me. Repeat these words. Lord, I am sorry for having been so sorry. Lord God, I desire 
a relationship with you. I cannot save myself. Others like me cannot save me. But thank you, God, that you sent a Savior, your Son, and you sent him just for me. I open my heart now to you, Lord Jesus. I invite you to the throne of my heart. King of my life, I crown thee, Lord. Thine shall the glory be. Amen. If you have prayed this prayer in faith, though you do not have a relationship with God, you have one now. And we invite you to cultivate that by finding and joining a good Bible-believing, Christ-confessing fellowship of faith, a church. And when the church scattered comes again as the church united, be there. Be a part of that family of faith. We thank God for is allowing you to spend this part of your day with us. We only ask of you this. If the message has been a blessing to you, please, won't you share it with your friends? Share it through your social media. And share with someone what God in Christ Jesus has done for you and meant in your life. To make a contribution to this ministry, we invite you to find us on Givelify. Look for St. Andrew's AME Church and please make your contribution. You can also make a contribution by texting St. Andrew's A-M-E-C. That's S-T-A-N-D-R-E-W-S A-M-E-C to 73256. St. Andrew's A-M-E-C to 73256. And as we would prepare to close, we ask Carlos to lead us out with our closing selection. God is Good by Jonathan McReynolds. Over the course of this time, we hope that you will learn the words of this song and find comfort in them. It is a sweet, simple prayer that the Lord blessed Brother McReynolds to set to song. And we declare that every word of it is true. I'm going to ask Carlos if he will lead us in the singing of it.
always we pray God will continue to bless and keep you in all things our prayer for you is that you not allow the decision to stay well and live be decided and determined on the basis of politics or economics. Please stay home. Stop the spread. You will save lives. Yours and the lives of your loved ones, your family and friends. This is Philip Cousins saying God bless you and keep you. Pray for us as we will pray for you. Bye now.